All right, from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bowl shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. The Lord sets captives free. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I just want, want you to see the scriptural basis for this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Before you complain about your leaders, I hope you're praying about them. I hope you're praying for not just, not just your um, leader at work, even the leaders that you don't like. And we get, as Christians, you know, we get to approach the throne of God. You get that? You see, we take that, don't, don't take that for granted. We get to boldly approach the throne of God at any time and intercede for those around us, for, the, for our fellow saints, and for those who don't know the Lord. But we know that at one day, all the nations are going to flow to the throne of God. And so we want to pray right now for the nations to repent if they have not, and to grow in their love and affection for the Lord. So would you bow your head with me? Gracious Father in heaven, Thank you for the morning. Thank you for the sunrise. Thank you for the sunset. Thank you for every single thing, every single aspect of life, all the graces that you give us. You have blessed us richly. And so first of all, God, we want to thank you. We want to come to you. We are here, God. We are not here ultimately because of our nationality. We are here because of you. And we thank you for that grace that you've so richly given us. And God, thank you for giving us, for, for this, this nation that has honestly borrowed from your principles in a lot of ways on how to conduct ourselves. And so God, we just pray for every single person, whether they're in Congress or uh, they're the executive or the judicial branch, God, we pray for our governing authorities. And we pray that conviction and grace would come near to the hearts of all those who are making decisions in this world. God, we pray for the nations overseas. We pray for the nations that, that have never even uttered the phrase, under God. God, we pray for that glorious day where you, not, not just from the ruling on high right now, because you are ruling and reigning, but in full complete glory, having dominion from sea to shining sea. God, you died to make men holy. Help us to live to make them, to show them freedom. True freedom, where the Spirit of the Lord is. God, you're so good. So, Lord, we also ask, we ask you so graciously, as you always do, answer our prayers. We ask that you come, Holy Spirit, that you fill our service from beginning to end so that we may glorify you, give it, to give you the blessing and the honor and the glory that you so richly deserve through our song and conduct this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand as we worship. Thank the Lord for this great country that we live in.
again. What a privilege it is to meet and gather in this way. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for, thank you for this land. Thank you for all of life and its joy. And help our hearts to rest in you this morning. Help us to see you. Please plant eternity before our eyes and give my guide that my speech so that we hear what you have to say this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, church, we are continuing our series this morning in the book of James, and we're calling it Faith in Action. So as for the book of James, most scholars believe, I I won't spend too much time in in review, but just a little bit, most scholars believe this letter was written by the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, And it would do us well to remember that James went from being a skeptic of his brother's claims, right? He went from being a skeptic to being a servant and his follower to his own brother. And he went to pen one of the most practical letters in the Bible, this letter full of wisdom. And all of it contains wisdom for godly living, how we conduct ourselves in in all areas of life that God has called us to. This is really much putting your faith in action. That's where we got the idea from. James is very much about an active faith, one that people can actually see coming out from what God has done in the heart. So last week we talked about the necessity of trials, how they're necessary. They're necessary. We know we have them because God's working all things together for our good. And so since we know that, we know that there must be a reason for them. And the trials we find ourselves in, they might be difficult, but God has made it abundantly clear through the Scripture that he is available at any time and in any need when we're having any hardship at all. And that's good news. So because of that, we can experience what's called joy through suffering. You can say, he has made me glad even when things look bad. It's possible. We can cast our cares on the Lord knowing that he truly does care for us. The Bible tells us that. So by his grace, we can count it not some joy, not a little bit of joy. We can count it all joy when trials of all kinds come our way. So we're going to turn in our Bibles to James chapter 1, and we're going really far today. We're just going from verses 2 to 8. So we backed up a little bit, and that's okay. There's a reason for that. The sermon this morning builds on the theme of last week, and it's entitled, Don't Doubt, Ask God. Don't Doubt, Ask God. Now, we all have doubts. You have doubts. I have doubts. And remember, doubt, the word doubt itself, doubt is not a bad thing, okay? So sometimes, sometimes it's not. It depends on what you're doubting. So, for instance, it's okay to doubt a source that's not credible. Uh, don't, don't believe everything you read on the internet, right? Uh, it's okay to doubt everything you see on the internet. Um, so sometimes doubt might be our first reaction to bad news, or maybe some of us are a little more pessimistic than others. And by the way, anytime doubt is, uh, has to do with God, that's when it's bad. Anytime it has to do with God, doubt is wrong and should be Uh, should be avoided. So, trick question, what is the opposite of doubt? No, it's not. It's not, but you might think so. Uh, It is not faith. So, so we got to be careful here. So, I want you to imagine in your mind, put doubt in the middle of a spectrum, okay? Put doubt in the middle of a spectrum, and on, on one end, I want you to put unbelief, and on the other end, I want you to put faith. Okay, this is, this is a good way of understanding doubt. Unbelief right, is, the, is the opposite of faith. It's the complete reverse. But doubting is a step toward unbelief. So when you doubt, you step away from faith. You continue to move down the spectrum until eventually you get to unbelief completely, and that's what we call apostasy. So here's the question. Do you, do you seek help when you're dealing with trouble? Do we do that? Do we kind of bottle it up and try to do it on your own? What is your first reaction when something comes your way? 
any kind of trial. How about uh, when you're going through something menial, something that doesn't trivial, something that doesn't seem like it matters? Do you go to God with the big stuff, with the little stuff? Because that's exactly what James tells us to do in these next few verses. So let's go ahead and read James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is the word of the Lord. All right. So it's important to look at these verses. The reason we backtrack, it's important to look at them in their context. So there's actually a connection between verses 4 and 5. And you might already have noticed it. So James goes from talking about persevering in trials, working toward this goal, striving toward this goal of being perfect and lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. So, so remember, that's, that's a mindset, right? We're, we're, we're to strive to live as the Lord wants us to live. That's not legalism. That's fruit. Amen? Amen. Now, we're to press on for the kingdom of God. He ends verse 4. James chapter 1 ends verse 4 with lacking in nothing, only to pick up in verse 5 on a different kind of lack. Do you see it? It's, it's the same Greek word, actually, and it means to be without. It means to be wanting. So to not lack in something would be to have no further need, but to lack would be to continue to have that need. So there's also a conditional tone, right? Because he says if, if. If any of you lacks wisdom. If. So do you see what God is telling us plainly here? It's not very flattering, but he knows we lack. He knows we lack. And, and, and just to see, uh, just for a, a showcase, maybe this will help as a demonstration. Who doesn't, who in here does not believe that they need wisdom? Do we have a show of hands for the one that doesn't need wisdom? There are no takers. Obviously. He knows we lack. So all of us should feel lack when we're talking about this wisdom. But, but this is a specific kind of wisdom. Okay, It's not just wisdom in general. It's a different kind. And the reason for that is the context of what James is saying. This, this is the type of wisdom that helps us understand the trials that we talked about last week. So we need to get the mind of God in order to understand the difficulties we face. In this world, we will face trouble. And it's like this. When the sea is without waves, saints will be without trials. It's just the way it is. Remember, it's not if trials come your way, right? It's when. And I just want to challenge you. Let's say that you did. You you, you got the God's eye view of a trial, and you understood it. I have a feeling that not in every case that that would actually make you feel better knowing. I just want to challenge you with that thought. Understanding does not equal everything. It doesn't help everything. So, we have all gone through difficult times, and some of us have dealt with harder situations than others, some much harder. So, how do we understand that pain? When the world is bitter, the word is sweet. It helps us understand these things. The word offers heavenly wisdom. It's not the same as earthly. It helps us make sense of this perceived mess around us. And the reason I say perceived is because it's not actually a mess. It's not. And it might look like it sometimes, but whatever we find ourselves going through, it might, 
What looks like pointless chaos is actually an unfinished masterpiece. It really is, and we need to get the mind of God to see it. There's a work in progress around you, and there's a work in progress inside you. That's the Holy Spirit. We need wisdom to see it. We need wisdom to get past the junk and the kind of perspective that causes us to view life like this. To quote Charles Spurgeon, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me upon the rock of ages. Beautiful. So just like athletes tend to learn more when they lose games. That's might have been my experience. When I lose a competition, I tend to ask questions as to why. You tend to lose more, learn more when you lose, but we tend to learn more as people when we go through hardships about our character. How do you know? Again, just like last week, how do you know if you're a patient person, person if your patience has never been tested? How do you know how loving you are until your love is challenged? Trials. Joy is always available. Because God told us it is. We have to remember that. Godly wisdom helps us see life in this way. And that brings us to the first point. Godly wisdom is divine knowledge put into practice. Put into practice. And we could define wisdom, right? We could define wisdom simply as knowledge that you do. Knowledge put into practice, So as Christians, this would be the truths that we believe, the truths that we find in Scripture, the truths that we hold to, begin to affect the way we live. And if we know it, it's one thing to know, it's quite another to do. Amen? So proper faith leads to proper action. Righteous belief leads to righteous behavior. And it seems obvious, but we have to remember it is necessary to have Faith in God to live to the glory of God. Faith is a prerequisite for honoring God, not faith in faith, okay? You've heard that before? Not, not faith in my faith. That means the faith in what I think God's going to do. That's different. No, faith in God. So people, I mean, you know this, people have faith in some pretty wacky stuff. Let's just be honest, wacky stuff. Um, lizard people, Rule in the world? That's kind of strange. Uh, let's, 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 but let's use the, the example of the news, okay? So just because you might doubt all the reporting coming out of one news outlet, and I'm certain that many of you do, it doesn't mean we should have absolute faith in the truthfulness of what comes out from the reporting of the station that we like. There's something called bias, right? We've all got it. You can't avoid it. But when it's unchecked, it enters the realm of faith. And faith is another thing that's been a bit abused, honestly. Uh, Faith does not mean uh, blind credulity. Faith is not, what do I mean by that? Faith faith without reason, I think St. Augustine said this actually, faith without reason is credulity. And so what that means is there's nothing, so you're you're like faith in just because that's the way I feel about it, right? So I can talk to a Mormon, for instance, and I've seen it happen. I can talk to them about their convictions and they can get to the point where they will get so stagnant and angry and tell me, I know what you're saying to me. I, I know what you're saying to me is not true because I know deep down in my heart I have a God felt conviction that it is true. And the Muslim will say the same thing. And the Buddhist. But you see, reason is also a tenet that we use. And so it is quite reasonable, I believe, to have faith in God. Not in myself. Misguided faith leads us astray. But if it is, it's not truly a faith in God. So there's a distinction between godly wisdom and earthly wisdom. So earthly wisdom, good tenet of earthly wisdom, it's it's always changing. If something is earthly wise, it probably happened 
two years ago, and now everybody thinks it's great. But it has no lasting fruit. Earthly wisdom is temporary. It, it, it usually changes due to cultural pressure, pressure or shifting ideologies. What's popular? What's in season? That's earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom is like what? It's like shifting sand. And what's wise in the world's eyes, you've got to remember this, guys. It's so easy. Every, all of you have social media platforms. Maybe not all of you. The, the faithful few that don't. All of us who get on social media platforms, you see this happen, right? It's, it's kind of, uh, it's a bit insane, really. It's like you, you see somebody, you get to find out, you can, twel- you can tell what is trending, what is everybody saying that everybody likes, and then there's almost this, in, this indignant, okay, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta let everybody know what I think about this, right? Because my thoughts are gonna change their thoughts. Here we go, let's go. I'm going to let them know. Everybody needs to know. You know, maybe, maybe, I certainly know that not everybody needs to know my inner dialogue. And, and, and honestly, I'm kind of on a tangent here. Maybe I need to step away. You like the new pulpit, by the way? Maybe we need to watch out because this creates this trending, this, this need to be known and to be seen and be heard. It's, it's, it's kind of, narcissistic, honestly. I've, I'm, and I'm guilty of it too. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm immune to this by any means, no. But you, you think, you know, what, what, what is it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? Boy, we gotta watch the troughs that we're drinking from. That was a tangent. Earthly wisdom, anyway. It's like shifting sand. Um, and remember, so sometimes, you know, you know, there's a lot of, there's like some philosophers that people like, or there's uh, teachers that people like that aren't necessarily Christian, and what's going on there, it's, it's kind of a phenomenon, it's interesting. I, I just remember, again, not to bore you with St. Augustine, but all truth is God's truth. Amen? You know what that means? Whenever somebody, you know, you know my dad used to tell me, a blind squirrel finds a nut. Okay? Every now and then, a blind squirrel finds a nut. And so every now and then you've got these people these, that are teaching. A lot of the Stoics and the, the Aristotelian philosophers, they get like there's some things that line up with what the Bible says, and it's like, oh, okay, but not in all ways. But the ways in which they line up with the truth, that's not theirs. They're borrowing it. It's God's truth. Amen? All right, Proverbs is full of the contrast between the wise and the foolish. Godly wisdom, it doesn't change. It's like the Lord. I, the Lord, I do not change. Godly wisdom does not change. The Bible contains timeless principles that it will always help because it's full of his wisdom. He shared it with us. And again, there's a difference between being smart and being wise. Thank God. Because there's a lot of people that are smarter than me. There's a lot. But again, smart, intellectual, it does not equal wise, right? Again, so we're touching on this again, but what good is the knowledge that's unapplied? What's good if you know it, but you don't put it into practice? It's one thing to know what's right, and it's an entirely different matter to do what is right. And I wouldn't put that into a dichotomy for you to choose. I would just tell you to seek both. Seek both. Know what's right and do what's right. Don't be hearers only. Be doers. Same guy wrote that. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we must know our God if we wish to gain wisdom. So wisdom, it breaks through our minds and into your heart. That's what happens. When you get wise, this is what's going on. It's getting through your hard head. I'm pretty stubborn. It's getting through your head, and it's getting into your heart to the point where you're actually applying it, and it's got lasting behavioral change in your life. Gospel caveat. Gospel caveat. So it's, it's difficult to put godly things into practice sometimes, right? It's difficult. It's definitely not applauded often. 
sometimes I'm not patient enough. Maybe, I'm going to try to broad strokes here, but maybe you have a temper that gets away. Uh, maybe you're kind of hard to work with. Maybe you're rude. Maybe you like to talk to people about other people. That's called gossip. And whatever it may be, I want you to take heart. Take heart. None of those behaviors are wise. I'm guilty of them too. All of us are likely guilty of partaking in these in some way, shape, or form at some times. But here's the encouragement, and this is what you got to believe, because when you're called a hypocrite, you need to remember this. You need to know this, brother or sister. Where are you at today? You're in church. You're in church. We don't come here because we think we got it all together. Does anybody come here because they think they have it all together? Christians don't go to church, or at least they shouldn't. It's got to get beyond being right. Amen? It's not about being right. It's about being faithful. And being faithful will make you right, but it's a different route. We don't listen to sermons or, or hymns or great worship songs. We don't do that because, oh, we put that. No one's as great as I am. That's completely besides the point. We came here to worship Jesus Christ. And if you know anything about the Christian faith, Christians gather to worship Jesus Christ because they know where they'd be without him. We go to church because we need grace. We go because we need wisdom. Jesus Christ is like the embodiment of wisdom. He's full of grace and truth. He is the true treasure, and wisdom flows from the person that he is. So I'm not always wise. That's saying it lightly. We're not always wise, but he was wise in every situation he faced. Not once was he a fool. Came to seek and save the lost. He makes those who were once wise in the eyes of the world... Truly wise, truly wise. So better to be reckoned a fool by the world than a fool to God. Remember that. The gospel speaks to our failures. When you're not wise, remember the wisdom of Christ. When you fail, get on your knees, go to God, and then get back up and press on. That's 101 right there. Repent, confess, believe, get up. God is always willing to take you back. And it's not as if you've been lost. You just might feel like you have. Okay? Because the Bible says, he who began a good work in you, what? Will bring it to completion. Doesn't stop what he starts. So do you lack wisdom? Again, How do we fix that? If God doesn't desire us to lack in our conduct, what do we do? The Bible says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Ask God for wisdom. So I love the book of James. It puts it so clear. Like that's, that's as blunt as it gets. I'm not very wise. Well, have you asked God about it? Oh, that's, that sounds really simple. Yeah. Ask God. We, we can't just wait for him to zap us with wisdom, right? Don't do that. There's actually, there's no good promises in Scripture for apathy. There's ruin. Ruin is promised for apathy. But there are promises in Scripture with action. When it comes to doing things in faith. Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13 says it like this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. We need to ask. We need to draw near to God. So let's look at Matthew 7, 7 through 8. I'm just going to pull it up briefly. Matthew 7. If you have it, well, if you have it in your Bible, we'll just keep going. I'm going to read it. 
Matthew 7, 7 through 8 says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Have you asked God for understanding? Start there. Before you, before you wonder, let's come back to these trials again. Before you wonder why this happened, why that happened. Before you stress out about the current situation that you're finding yourself in, you've got to always remember, have I gone to God about this yet? Have I asked God about this yet? Have I asked for wisdom? Am I reacting in haste? Have I thought all of this through? So that you got the option there. You can take the deep dive of despair or you can go before the throne of God. How does God give when we ask of him? What's the Bible say? It says he gives to us liberally, generously. Word can be translated sincerely, which means in the best possible way. And the phrase back in James chapter 1, it, it could be translated this. James chapter 1, 5 could actually be translated this. Let him ask the giving God. Let him ask the giving God. God is a generous God. Generous. So it's clear. Whatever, whatever we find ourselves dealing with, we're to take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Take it. If you haven't, take it. Ask him. He doesn't withhold blessing. He doesn't. It's not what kind of God he is. He doesn't withhold blessing from someone with a faithful heart. He doesn't turn away the downtrodden or the contrite. So we know we should ask him. We got that down. Ask God. This is what I should do. How? In what manner? In what way should I ask God? And that brings us to point number two. Faith builds a bridge from this world to the next. I don't know who said that, but I like it. And so maybe this is going to be one of those, like I always say, that Pastor Lon tells me to do. But I clearly found it. Faith builds a bridge from this world to the next. So when I read that, I think when you apply it to our faith, I think we, we need to get the perspective of God. We need to look at things from the God standpoint. Let's look at this next verse in James uh, James chapter 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So if we ask God, we must ask him in faith without doubting. Again, James puts it quite blunt and clear for us as to how we're supposed to do this. Doubt is not steady. A doubtful person is like someone stranded at sea, right? They don't know what they're going to do, and they have no secure foundation. And unfortunately, the person that is always doubtful, like doubtful to the point of unbelief, like we talked about earlier, they're allotted with the wicked, with the wicked. Isaiah 57, Isaiah 57, 20 says this, the wicked are like what? The wicked are like the tossing of the sea, which cannot rest, whose ways cast up mire and mud. The wicked are doubtful. And so the one who doubts, think of it this way, has a, has a, has a divided heart. A divided heart. So that spectrum again, faith on this end, unbelief on this side, doubt, and whatever you decide to do with that doubt, is going to depend on whether you move toward faith or whether you move toward unbelief. Doubtful person cannot make up their mind because of that divided heart. So a person that's default is to doubt, meaning that's what they tend to do first, especially through hardship. Take heart. I just want to challenge you. That, that's the path to unbelief. Be careful. Be careful. Verse 7. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. 
He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The doubtful cannot expect to receive anything from God. They are double-minded, or, or the word actually straight in the Greek is double-souled. Double-souled. They are much up and down in their thoughts. And, and James is actually the only one to use this word in the Bible, and he uses it again later. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Right? So what I would call this, the way to understand being double-souled, it's kind of like, forgive the analogy, but it's like lifestyle hokey pokey. Okay? You put your left foot in, you take your left foot out. You put your right foot in, you put your right foot out. Sometimes when you don't know what to do, you shake it all about. <laughs> Turn yourself around and do it again. Double-minded, double-souled is like lifestyle hokey pokey. The Bible says that love the Lord your God with... All, all your heart. So even the Old Testament touched on this theme. There are, they, a doubtful person is up and down, again, in their thoughts. They're restless, tossed about. So sometimes we, have, we, we don't have a lot of sea around here, okay? The, the sea is not, uh, uh, the sea is not close in the Midwest. I was going to say native. So, for Midwest people, maybe an easier analogy would be wakes instead of waves. Wakes. Everybody knows what a wake is, right? A wake is an area of water whose movement has been changed by a boat or a ship moving through it. Wakes are like man-made waves. Man waves. And as much as I want to use jet skis as an analogy... I just did. Um, as much as I want to do that, imagine being in a small boat on a lake. Maybe you've got a kayak, maybe you've got a John boat, you're sitting in the middle of the lake, you've got calm water, you're looking, maybe you, maybe you brought your drink out there and you're, you're sipping it, and oh, this is great, this is great, can't get any better. And suppose you're sitting there, and while you're sitting, a large speedboat comes right by you, very near. What is going to happen? You're going to get wet, and you're going to get rocked, and there's not a thing you can do about it. So is, is there any way, and you ask yourself the question, this is just, just basic question, is there any way that you aren't affected by this external force that came towards you? No, there is nothing you can do. You have to take it. And so, I mean, there are, there are two options, but both of them, one of them will make things ten times worse, maybe a hundred times. You can either decide to take it in the boat, get rocked, get wet, and if you, you, can, you can get out of the boat, but then you're losing more ground and possibly your boat. All you can do is wait for the water to calm down again. So that, that's the analogy of doubt, Okay. That's what it's like to be a doubtful person, to be hit by these wakes, hit by waves, constantly not knowing which way to go. The water on the lake, by the way, will calm down again in its own time. You don't get to say when it stops being rocky. Jesus can. Isn't that cool? Jesus commands the sea. Stop. And it listens. So sometimes, what I'm trying to tell you here is sometimes life doesn't ever settle down. It's like, oh, if I just get to here, if I just get to there, you need to stop that. I know we're all prone to doing that. Stop. That's not how it works. Sometimes life doesn't ever settle down. It's storm after storm. It's trial after trial. And, and you can't control when difficult times show up or leave. And what control do we really have anyway? You do have one. You can control how you react. You, 
can control how you react. And that is where faith comes in. The doubt approach to life is the despairing approach. It leads to perhaps a nothing matters kind of philosophy. So have you ever tried to get somewhere, but you didn't know where somewhere was? That's difficult to find if you don't know where you're going. Driven folks, they get that. They're like, hey, man, if you don't know what to aim at, how do you expect to hit anything? Right? How do you expect to accomplish anything? So if, we don't, if we don't have faith or we aren't following God, how do we manage those hardships? And so we combine these thoughts. Combine this thought about wisdom, this thought about doubt and faith, and what James has proposed to us. To doubt is to be divided. Clearly. It's like trying to face different directions at the same time. It's very difficult to do. I don't recommend you try to do that. Godly folks try to follow the path of wisdom. They make up their minds. Paul says, I'm fully persuaded in my own mind. Not his own opinions about things. That's not what he means. He means, I'm fully persuaded of what I believe in sincerity of heart that God is trying to tell you and me. Make up their minds. The wise wise men, wise women, they change their minds. Fools, they have none to change. Faith approach is quite different. So let's look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 6. You don't have to turn there unless you want to. We've got it right here. Here we go. And without faith, it is, I want everybody to say that. What is it? Without faith. Impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We cannot effectively live for God if we don't have faith. We have to trust him in the good times and the bad, and the bad. And it all comes down to belief. So when we sin, all sin, by the way, is rooted in unbelief, and when we we sin, we are failing to believe God in the moment. That's what's going on. That's a war for your heart. So when you're dealing with doubt, the, the natural inclination, the natural man wants to run away from God, to back off. But that's not the biblical approach. That's the road to unbelief. The proper reaction to doubt is to run to God. Sprint to God. Have faith. Faith is like a shield that can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith is not crushed by trials and temptations. It's actually strengthened by it. Faith rises up and protects us from the devil and his armies. Faith anchors us to God. It's like a bridge, but it can't be broken. It ascends from my heart to his hands. And when I know who holds the future, I have the strength to live today and tomorrow and ever after. And you know the future because we've been told. We have it right here. Sure. Trials can make us doubt. But they can make us grow. So tell me, many of you, just think. Think. Look back on a trial you face and tell me you can't see the fingerprints of God. You can't see the work of God in your life. I'm certain many of you can attest to how he's brought you through the storm. So when life gets tough, what are you turning to? What are you turning to? O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness to see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Look to Jesus. So small side note. Shouldn't have talked about barbecue and fireworks, right? We're all ready for that. Small, I'll keep it brief. Many of you are looking forward to celebrating 
the nation tomorrow. And that's great. Really, it's great. Um, and remember, just like Chuck was saying, spiritual freedom is the greatest kind. Because what happens to liberty when it degenerates is it turns into autonomy. And autonomy is not good. That's doing whatever I want at the, at regardless of the consequences of the action. Freedom. Spiritual freedom. Liberty. So wherever you go to celebrate, if you, if you go somewhere public, I, I just, hey, point people to Jesus because he sets people free in the truest way that freedom exists. Free from sin and alive to God. I love, this, uh, I love this verse from the Battle Hymn of the Republic. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. See, some of these the best hymns, they've got, they're getting ideas from the Scripture. He is sifting out the hearts of all before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift my soul to answer him. Be jubilant my feet. Press on, but you be lacking in nothing. Our God is marching on, and we're gaining ground. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and help other people to turn their gaze on him too. Whom the Son sets free, what? Worship team, go ahead and come up. Now I really am almost done. I really am. Proverbs 2.6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 2.6. Psalm 1, what's it say of the person who delights in the word of God and meditates on him day and night? What's that person like? It says they're like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Those rooted in the truths of the faith will not falter when pressure comes. So maybe you have a need and maybe you have not because you've asked not. Ask first. Ask him. Take it to the Lord. Believe. Trust. Faith builds a bridge from this world to the next. Are you thankful? We serve a great God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you that we can ask for an increased faith, just like the apostles asked. God, so I ask that you increase the faith of every person in this room. I pray that you give us godly insight, wisdom from on high, to where we can see things from your point of view. And I pray that your name is exalted and for that day when it's exalted from sea to sea. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.